Good morning. Welcome to Branson Christian Church. Do we have visitors this morning? Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you for anticipating my next line. If you're a visitor, please hold up your hands. We have something for you. Is that it? We would ask uh, the visitors, you, all of you have a tear-off sheet in your bulletin, of course. We would ask particularly the visitors to fill them out um, so that we may be aware of your presence. And any, as always, any of our members that have things to update or prayer requests, please tear those off and put them in there as well. Last time I was up here was probably the only time ever there were no announcements and I was kind of worried that I would jinx it again, but I think Cindy has an announcement. So. First of all, to let you know, uh, we've been so busy at the thrift store that we're running out of the plastic sacks. So if any of you have been saving your stash at home, coming home from Walmart or wherever, harders, whatever. We take all, all shapes and sizes. So if you have some extra bags hanging around, please bring them to the church and we'll take care of them. Secondly, uh, the worship committee meeting will be this Tuesday morning at 1030. Uh, so those that are, can, that have been serving on the worship committee, if you can make it, we appreciate your attendance. Lastly, the board meeting will be this Thursday at 530. Please remember, if you are an elder, a deacon, or officers, please remember you are members of the board, and we would appreciate you being there at the meeting. And I think that's all I have. Did you have one, Rob? Uh, yes. Uh, one change to the bulletin, the first prayer song will be, He Knows My Name, instead of the one that's listed in there, which I, my, my mistake, put in there twice, two, two Sundays in a row. But uh, something fresh, I think it'd be better. And I'm going to uh, play through the doxology that we have done before in this, uh, in the tradition of this church, but we haven't done it recently. So let's, uh, it's actually page 573 in the Living Church Hymnal, um, and it, it's just the regular words, praise God from whom all blessings flow. It sounds like this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here be. You can sing... <coughs> Praise Him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen, amen. For the benefit of our first-time visitors and a reminder to all of the rest of us, we, for the past year since we lost our pastor, have been conducting a pastor search. So we've had pulpit supply and visiting ministers and, and some of the congregation now and again. So we welcome back for the second Sunday in a row, Russell Bramer. We're happy to have you with us. And I believe that will be it, and the acolytes will bring in the light of Christ. I imagine we're all familiar with the, with the saying, today is the first day of the rest of your lives. And that's clearly an obvious statement, but it seems to also speak inspiration to most of us. And I 
I think one of the reasons for that is that it implies that since each day is a new one, we also have a hand in creating the rest of our lives each day in our attitudes, in our beliefs, and in our dealings with people. Each day, a new creation given by God, put into our hands, and manifested by each of us uniquely. As we gather for worship today, may we ponder how that affects our lives today and each day. Shall we stand for the hymn of faith? It's number one in your hymnals, but it will also be on the screen. Holy, holy, holy. Shall we pray? We gather as a congregation, Lord, to celebrate your presence with us and your gift of each new day. May this time of group worship translate into increased effectiveness in what we make of those daily gifts. We remain standing for the first praise hymn.
be seated. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord, our God, on this morning dedicated to you, renew our spirits, strengthen our faith, help us to truly experience the joy and relief that comes with knowing that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, you are restoring your creation and drawing all of creation back into your fold. The new order of your spirit has begun. Thank you for calling us here, for choosing us to be active participants in your transformative work. We are humbled to be counted among your faithful followers. Today we are reminded of the glory that awaits, indeed the glory that reveals itself now and then in the here and now. You are at work. The completion of your plan is assured. Thank you for including us in your design. We confess, O oh Lord, we are not worthy of such high honor. We are often soft in our faith, timid in our expression of it, unsure of what you want us to do. We ask that you forgive us when we fall short of our potential. Forgive us when we are distracted forgetful, doubtful, afraid. Hear us when we say we have faith in you. Strengthen our resolve to live our faith, to be living examples of your love and loyalty to all. And hear us now as we joyfully pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you remember Nolan uh, Berry, who now lives with Sandra in the Kansas City area. He helped me market some songs to Nashville. This was one that he marketed, and we got some pretty good interest in it, but uh, nobody else other than me has ever recorded it. So this is it. came from a sign I saw on a little church marquee when I was traveling uh, back in the day when I had to travel in the winter and make my income for my little family during the winter when Branson didn't have a winter season. Um, and I can't even tell you where that little church was, but on the marquee it said, faith stops where worry begins. And I went, that's a song. <laughs> this is it.
The gathering for the communion service of the Lord's Supper is a central part of any disciple's service. Symbols of the bread and wine are taken together to point to the awesome mystery of our oneness with God as we celebrate Jesus' gift of our new creation, not only here at the table, but with us each day as well. The communion hymn is number 398, one of my favorites, I Come to the Garden Alone. We will stand on the second verse.
night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples with him in an upper room to share a meal with them. He knew they didn't. That the next day he would be whipped, tortured, and crucified. Before sundown the next day, he would be dead. And he had something important he wanted them to hear and to know and to remember. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Remember me. Likewise, he took a cup, and after he'd given thanks, he said, Drink of it all, Drink of, it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. Gracious and loving Father, as we gather as a community of believers around your table, we come with many things on our hearts, spoken and unspoken. Remind us to stand still and gaze up, seeking your strength and guidance. Bring us together as we share in the common identity and comfort to link arms and support one another and prepare us to follow your example and go into the world to share the good news. As we take this bread, the symbol of your broken body, we know you provide the nourishment and strength that we need at any given moment. Never forsaking us, your love never fails in times of praise or struggles. In these quiet moments, come and refresh and renew us. And now the prayer continues. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to partake of this communion. Help us to be mindful every day of the blood shed at Calvary and to be ever thankful for the healing and salvation it brings. Let the joy of that salvation be on our lips and on our faces throughout the week. And let the light of Christ shine brightly through each of us and change the lives of those we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The more we realize the power of God's gift of a new day and new creation, it seems like the more opportunity we have to respond by sharing our gifts back to God and our gifts of ourselves to each other. This time of sharing allows us another way to offer our monetary gifts. The deacons will now come forward to accept our offerings. In this act of giving, Lord, we present not only money, but also the gifts of hands, hearts, and minds. We ask that you take all these gifts and guide them to faithful service in the best possible ways, including through each of us in each new day. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This ends the reading of the scripture.
I'm glad to be back. It's good to see you. I see some folks that weren't here last week. I've got a confession. I have bad news. My wife's not with me. Now, if you were here last week, you know what that means. It means I'm not going to talk loud enough. I'll probably go too long. And some of you will fall asleep. Now, if you don't understand that, you can ask someone to explain it who was here last week. Not now. Wait till after the service. I, I confess, I preached for over an hour once. I did. As a young preacher, my parents were in town. They came to church. I don't know what I was doing. I got carried away. As we were driving home, my dad said, you know, son, I love to hear you preach, but if you ever go on like that again, I'm walking out. <laughs> and I never went on like that again, so you're safe. 50 minutes is the best. <laughs> I was taking my daughter home from vacation Bible school. She was five. She's 40 now. No, oh no, almost 40 now. <sighs> when she asked innocently as we were driving along, where is God? That wasn't a philosophical question. That wasn't a theological question. That was the innocent question of a five-year-old who wanted to know where God was. She knew her, where her mom was. She was at home. She knew where her brother's school was. We were going to pass it on the way home. She wanted to know, where is God? My mother was born in 1922, literally in a log cabin, outside of Fort Smith, Arkansas. Her father died in a swimming accident while she was still a toddler. She had four older, three older brothers. And so her mother was left at an early age to care for and raise four little children all under the age of five. Mother was the youngest. And it was during the Depression. And I asked her, how did you survive? And she said, what? We had a house. We had a well. We had chickens. We had a cow. We had a garden. We were fine. And I looked at her and said, you were fine? Didn't you want anything else? And she said, Why? She also told me wonderful stories about the woman that raised her because when her mother died, the four of them went to live with their grandmother, who I had the privilege of knowing when I was really young. And she, she told this wonderful story about one time they were standing in the kitchen looking out the window over the sink and they saw their dog, Shep, come out of the woods with a rabbit in his mouth. And they ran outside and they got that rabbit and it was still warm and they had meat for supper. Now, I don't know about you, but in my family, I tell the kids, if it's been in the dog's mouth, don't eat it. <laughs> they had a drought. It got scary because their little garden was drying up. Their well was running dry, and that was devastating for them. But then the clouds opened up, and the rain just poured. And all four of the kids and my great-grandmother went out into the yard and raised their hands up and let it rain all over them and praise God for the rain. You know, not very long ago, we had a very different relationship with nature. But we don't really attribute rain or storms to God's activity so much anymore. The weatherman tells us they're coming because of a front moving in, a cold front hitting a warm front, and that's going to create the rain. We can still be our uh, we can still be awed by the power of nature in a tornado or an earthquake. 
thunderstorm, flood, hurricane. It's not the same. We can still get a sense, a glimpse of what it must have been like when we're walking in the woods or wading through a stream or staring at a gorgeous sunset or a beautiful rainbow after a storm. Still not the same. I was driving my son somewhere when he was 15 years old when all of a sudden he said, you know, I don't think I believe in God anymore. And when I got control of the wheel again, I said, well, then the burden is on you to explain where all this came from. Earth, planets, stars, birds. He said, I don't think about that stuff. Besides, what difference does it make? And so out of the mouths of my two children came the premier challenge to the church today. To be able to answer the question, where is God and what difference does it make? We have got to be able to make, to to give an answer to those two questions. People used to know. People used to know where to point to when somebody said, where is God? The little village about an hour's train ride outside of Paris called Chartres. And when you get off the train in this little village, the one thing that you cannot miss is rising up out of the middle of the village like a monolith, the cathedral of Chartres. People knew. And people in the old days, well, no, people in every age create monuments to that which they value the most. When I was in Dallas, we had Texas Stadium. Now we've got the new stadium. I don't remember the name of it. They call it Jerry's House. In California, we had Disneyland. Every age creates monuments to that which they value most. The truth is, our culture presents us with a big challenge as people of faith. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Turn the other cheek. Take care of each other. Help the less fortunate. Pray for your friends and your enemies. Lift others up. The present culture says, it's mine. Anyone who doesn't agree with me is my enemy. The poor are lazy and there are too many of them to take care of anyway. I'll take care of me. You take care of you. You know what you really need is a new car, a new house, a new new dress. You need more. You don't have enough. That's our current culture. That's what we're up against. The current culture infiltrates our daily lives and our uh, our churches, the messages that we hear out there. I was with my daughter again. She was in high school at this point. We were in Atlanta, and we stopped at a deli for lunch, and I ordered a sandwich. She ordered a sandwich. When the meals were delivered, I started eating my sandwich and realized it wasn't what I ordered. But it was good, so I ate it anyway. At the end of the meal, the waitress came up to me and she said, I gave you the wrong sandwich. I said, I know, I ate it. She said, no, I bet you're mad. I said, it takes more than a sandwich to make me mad. She said, you don't understand if you say you're mad. I can get it for you for free. (laughs) And I looked at my daughter and I said, do not listen to this woman. This is the problem. Church softball team, uh, when I was in Irving, Texas, we had a church softball team, some uh, co-ed. And we were very competitive. We're playing on the field, and one of our players 
hits a ball and he's running, trying to outrun the pitch to first. And when the ball comes to the first, he makes sure his foot hits that first baseman's ankle and twists it good and she goes by. Everybody saw it. The bench is emptied. And we have this brawl of church teams out in the field. We, we can't be a witness to the kingdom of God with this kind of stuff. It's crazy. I uh, was also the director of a church uh, camp in Athens, Texas, called the Christian Youth Foundation. Now they call it, uh, uh, they call it something different. <laughs> uh, it's still there. It's very nice. We had a rule in, in, at the camp that, uh, because we would have sometimes different groups, and so at lunchtime, we had a rule that said, we're going to be, you can come and eat as long as we have food to serve. We don't want to have to throw any of it away. But nobody can come back a second time until everybody's had a chance to go through it once. Well, one group got a little delayed, and a woman that had been already there and was finished eating, she came up to go through the line again. And, and Frances, the head of the kitchen, who was a delightful woman, said, you know, I, I know we'll probably have enough food to be able to serve everybody, but the rule is we, we can't have you go through the line until everyone's been through the line once. That woman got mad. And she said, well, can I have a roll? And Frances said, of course, and gave her a roll, and she hit her with it. Hit Frances with a roll all in the name of Christ. The culture permeates things, but it's not, the, it's not the culture of the kingdom of God. So where is the intersection? Paul knows. Paul knows as if anybody is in Christ, behold, the scripture was read, it is a new creation. It can also be translated, if anyone is in Christ, behold, there is the new creation. Breaking into our present, the presence of a future development as if presently existed or accomplished. In other words, there is a preview of coming attractions. Where is God? There. My entire understanding of God's kingdom and God's work in the world can be summarized in two phrases, here and there, now and then, in the meantime, in between time. Here and there, now and then, we get a glimpse of the breaking forth of God's new age. But we live in the in between time, the death of Christ to the full establishment of God's kingdom. In the meantime, in between time. That's where we live. Oh, I, I, I was reminded while I was preparing this uh, of a, a, a song George Strait sings. I don't know if you've heard of George Strait, but uh, he, he's, he's one of my favorites. I'm a George Strait junkie. He sings, uh, just walk down the street to the coffee shop had to take a break. I've been by her side for 18 hours straight. Saw a flower growing in the, up in the middle of the sidewalk, pushing up through the concrete, like it was planted there for me to see. The flashing lights, the honking horns, all seemed to fade away in the shadow of the hospital at 508. His fingerprints are everywhere. I just looked down to stop and stare. Open my eyes, and then I swear, I saw God today. I love that song. I'd have sung it to you, but then you wouldn't have loved it at all. <laughs> so God has made himself known. Anywhere people are gathered together in worship, anywhere people are doing the work of the Lord in service to God, wherever the hungry are being fed, Wherever the hopeless are being given hope, wherever the lonely are being visited and comforted, that's where God is. 
That's where we can point. God has made himself known. And then Paul goes on to say something absolutely amazing. Amazing. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Entrusting with us the message, God entrusts with us the message of reconciliation. No longer slaves of a destructive culture, but citizens of the kingdom of God. We are ambassadors. That makes the church our embassy. This is the embassy of God. You know, when you enter the embassy of a foreign country, you're no longer in America. When you enter that country's embassy, their grounds, you are no longer in America. You're in that country. You go by their rules, their culture. I, I was privileged. Uh, my sister was working in Paris, and I got to go over and visit her. And I went to the uh, American embassy in France, in Paris. And I got to tell you what an experience that was. You walk through the gates. I was feeling a little homesick anyway, but I walked through the gates and I felt like I was home. Uniformed, dress uniformed Marines standing at the doorways. You walk through the door and you see the American flag, you see a picture of Lincoln, you see a picture of Abraham Lincoln. I thought I smelled fried chicken. I was home. So if a family's driving down Commerce Street, kids in the car, and a five-year-old asks an innocent question, where is God? Wouldn't it be great if the parent could point to this church and say, well, there's his embassy. His ambassadors are there. That's where God is. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's a big responsibility, and it is an important responsibility. Not only our witness to the community, but also our commitment and loyalty to each other. Now, I know, the reason I'm telling you all this is because I know that you're in the search for a, a full-time minister, a regular minister, not some guy like me that comes in now and then. And I pray on your behalf. And I know what you're hoping to find. Someone who's personable and articulate. Someone who continues to study the scriptures and the history and teachings of the church but isn't a, an egghead. Someone who will care deeply for you and your family and will care deeply about this church. Someone who will share your times of joy as well as your times of grief. Someone who's a good listener, patient, forgiving, compassionate, someone you can count on. I probably left some things out, but that's a pretty good list, don't you think? But churches can be hard on ministers. They can be hard on ministers. I've been serving churches a long time. I know. When I was uh, serving a student ministry in a little church in Jet, my sermon went on too long. Jenny's baby started crying in the back. And so I quipped, well, I guess I've gone on too long. I better wrap it up. After church, one of the elders came up to me, Rupert, and he said, you hurt Jenny's feelings by saying that. I was crushed. This is the first church I'd ever served. The only one, well, it's the first one I'd ever served as the preaching minister. And so I jumped in the car and I drove over the two blocks to Jenny's house. And I said, Jenny, if there's anything I said that offended you during the service, I did not mean it. And I, I beg your forgiveness. She said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well, when your baby cried, she said, that didn't bother me. Maybe it was my mother. So I jumped in the car and drove two more blocks over to Shirley's house. And I walked in and I said, Shirley, if I said anything during the service that was offensive to you or hurt your feelings in any way, please forgive me. She said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. 
So then I got in the car and drove over to Rupert's house. Rupert came to the door and I said, Rupert, you know, I went by Jenny's house and, and then Shirley's house and both of them don't have any idea what you're talking about. He said, well, if it had been me, it would have, been, it would have offended me. Okay. I mean, churches can be hard on people. I had a woman that came by the church every day during the week for a, a period of time, and she'd work on the bulletin board out in front of my office. Sometimes I'd step out and say hi. Sometimes I'd just stay behind my desk. But uh, she told the elders that, she, that I didn't care about her. So the elders called me to a meeting. They said, this, uh, I can't remember her name, uh, says she thinks you don't care about her. I said, why? Well, she comes by the church every day and you never ask about her. You never ask what's wrong. Did you tell her I don't read minds? Why were they talking to me and not her? I don't know. But when you're a young minister, that's harsh. So I know what you're looking for. But do you know what the uh, new minister is looking for? Coming to a new church fills a new minister with great anticipation and great anxiety because they're getting ready to bring their whole family to a new location. And it affects not only him or her, but the family. The minister wants to know how deep the commitment is here to the marriage once the honeymoon's over. Wants to know when the disgruntled begin to cause dissension, will the leadership step step up? Will the church members be as loving toward me and my family as they expect me to be toward them and their family? And when mistakes are made, and they'll be made, words poorly chosen, something overlooked. Will they give me the benefit of the doubt? Or am I only as good as my last sermon? If you want to be helpful, when the new minister comes, introduce yourself when you see him for about the first 40 or 50 times. He has more names to memorize than you do. And it would be helpful. Don't play the game. We met last week, do you know my name? He won't. That would be helpful. If the minister says something or does something that is particularly meaningful to you, not just everyday meaningful, but particularly meaningful, drop him a note. He'll save that note for the rest of his life. And it will help him get over the rough spots. My wife and I honeymooned in Jamaica. Now there's a spot. We went inside the, what I used to call the Holiday Inn compound. They called it the uh, resort. And uh, before we even got our room, there were a lot of Americans on the bus with us. They, they moved us into a conference room. And a representative came and she said, now, let me talk to you a minute about where you are. This is Jamaica, not America. When we say, no problem, man, we mean it. Time moves slower here. Breathe. And if you can put your watch away and turn your phone off and join the spirit of this island, you will have a wonderful time. And I want you to tell everybody when you get home. But if you can't, You're going to be miserable. And when you get home, don't tell anybody you were here. So we're all sitting out in the lobby waiting for uh, the bus to come and take us into dinner at downtown. And all the lights on the island go out. It's about the fourth day we were there. All the lights. It's just dark. We're just sitting there. And I hear a voice say, no problem, Mom. It was an American, and I said to myself, he's made it. 
He's made it. It was exasperating at first. Lynn and I uh, were on our honeymoon. It took us an hour and a half to get checked into our room. And when we got in there, it wasn't ready, and so we had to wait another hour. And I wasn't, I hadn't made it yet. I wasn't to the, oh, no problem man phase yet. But I got there before the, before the trip was over. So I have a, a, an idea. When you have prospective new members or new members join the church, pull them aside in a conference room and say, you know, when you come here, you're, you're entering a different culture here. It's different here for us. We're intentional about our faith. We care about each other. We lift each other up. We don't tear each other down. And if you can get in, get in the groove of our culture here, you'll love this church. If you can't, you probably won't. But wouldn't that be something? Instead of saying here and there, now and then, why not say here and now? Otherwise, what difference does it make? Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn. It's an invitation. It's the, uh, there's a sweet, sweet spirit number 581, we're going to sing one verse. I just mentioned to you we're going to stand and sing. The, uh, the invitation is for all of us uh, in different ways. If you're looking for a church home, this would be a time to come forward and, and make that known. But it's an invitation for all of us to recommit ourselves to who we are and why we are here as ambassadors. Let us stand together and sing. I know I've gone on too long already. It's because Lynn wasn't here, and so blame her. But I do want to say one more time what a pleasure it is to be here and how blessed you are. What a beautiful sanctuary. Stained glass window that's second to none, beckoning you to follow the Lord. Wonderful music, great leadership. This is the real deal. Anybody that watches this, by the way, from... uh, Facebook, no. Is it Facebook? No. If you're watching this, so, uh, and you're looking for a church home, a church family, where you'll be welcome and loved and cared about, everyone needs a church home like this. I promise you this is the real deal. Congratulations to you folks. Paul said... We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. If the foot says to the hand, I am not, I am not a hand. If the foot says I am not a hand, therefore I am not part of the body, does that make it so? No. 
we are one body in Christ. Now, I don't know if you're a hand or a foot or an elbow or an eye, but I do know you're part of the body. And when you're not here, we're diminished. But for now, go from this place. This embassy, represent your God and the new creation that has called you to be. Amen.